Welcome to customizing the ArcGIS API for JavaScript widgets. Um, as you might notice, we have sort of a pirate theme going on here. So you kind of see that throughout the slides. If you're wondering why we're wearing these, these funny hats. Um, so my name is Matt Driscoll. I'm on the JavaScript API team, and I focus on widgets and uh, ArcGIS Align templates. I'm here with uh, co-presenters JC Franco. He's on the ArcGIS uh, JS API team as well as me. And then I have um, Alan Sangma is in our creative lab, and he helps uh, do designs and make things look really pretty. So on the agenda today, we're going to uh, talk a little about customizing widgets, what we, talk, what we mean by customizing, um, go into the kinds of customizing you guys can do. And we're going to go through some of the prerequisites for things you need to know to be able to customize widgets. And then we're going to show you how to customize and work with view models of our widgets and what those are. And we'll have some uh, demos showing how you guys can customize them. And then we're going to go into how you can uh, customize and recreate widget views to have a totally different uh, user interface. And then we'll have uh, Alan go into theming, um, our API, and some of the out-of-box uh, themes that we have, and how you can uh, use SAS to kind of tweak the themes to fit whatever design or brand you need to do. And then uh, hopefully have some time for some questions and answers. If not, we'll be over at the island and you guys can kind of come uh, ask us questions there. So what do we mean by customizing? We mean taking an existing widget and extending it to do something new, something different. So taking, for example, one of the out-of-box widgets, like the search widget, and recreating its view to look totally different or extending it to add a new functionality. Uh, we also talk about recreating a view. So maybe you want to use one of our widgets, but you have a different framework in mind that you kind of want it to fit into. So we'll show you, how, uh, show you guys how to do that. And we'll show how to uh, create a theme for widgets. And we'll go into kind of like SAS and how you can do that easily with variables or go deeper if you really need to. So some of the prerequisites you need for this um, session is Accessor. Um, and that's kind of like a core uh, class of our API for getting, setting properties, and things like that. Um, another uh, basic knowledge of Esri widgets is helpful. And we have a shameless plug. Uh, we have a session tomorrow. It's kind of like uh, building widgets A to Z, everything you want, kind of want to know about creating a widget using our API. And that's tomorrow. Let's see. Tomorrow, 10.30 AM, Pasadena room. And then um, if you want to create widgets using our widget framework, uh, you need to know TypeScript. And we're going into that more detailed in our deep dive widget session on Friday. So here's just a link to the TypeScript guide on our uh, SDK pages. We have a nice guide that shows you um, how to set up TypeScript and, and use it with our API, basically. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, JC Franco. He's going to talk a little bit about Accessor. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? All right, cool. So Accessor, as uh, Matt mentioned, is uh, one of the backbones, of, well, it's was part of the foundation of uh, the JavaScript API. All of the classes um, are extending this, this accessor, so we have a common uh, ground. The uh, reason why it got introduced is to provide the, the um, one of the main reasons is uh, for it being in the API and it being the core is because it helps us provide a consistent developer experience. You may have seen that in a lot of the, the, the SDK samples or code snippets we show that <clears throat> there's a common pattern being uh, applied to how we access properties, how we set, create instances. And um, that's because of the, this foundation. The other neat thing is because um, we're doing internal TypeScript uh, support. Accessor is, um, you can develop with TypeScript with no problem. And I'll, I'll show a few, I'll talk about TypeScript in, in, a, in a little bit. So as I mentioned before, the part of the, that consolidated uh, developer experience is being able to uh, have this unified object constructor pattern where uh, if you can observe here that different, um, you can instantiate different classes kind of the same way. You just pass along this object with a set of properties, and those will all get automatically set on your instance. 
That's one of the benefits we get with uh, Accessor being the, the base. It also allows us to define properties, and not only that, define how pro properties should behave. So if you have a read-only property, you can define it to be uh, that way. Um, you can initialize it to a specific value if you wanted. Um, you can also alias it. So for example, and the second property I have here defined, whenever someone tries to access the bar property, it's actually gonna look up what the value of foo is. And there's also um, one of the, another feature that's pretty cool is the, um, auto, the concept about uh, auto casting, which means you can tell a property is a specific type and then you can expect the user to either pass an instance of that type or if, you, if um, the class or the property receives an object, it's gonna try to create an instance with that property as its uh, constructor argument. Another really neat thing is being able to watch for properties. So say you have in your view, you're interested in getting the maps, uh, the base map title. You could, uh, if you didn't use Accessor, you would need to probably uh, check if um, map changed and if map is uh, valid and then check if map has a base map and if it's valid and then check if that changed and uh, all that way, all that way down through the title. But uh, Accessor makes it really easy because you can specify a, a property string and it'll automatically take care of uh, checking that the properties uh, within that chain are, are, are exist and it will notify whenever the, the final value will, will change. Uh, you can also watch for multiple properties as the second uh, line shows. So if you're interested in five properties out of one instance, you don't have to write like five or six lines, it's just you can do it within the same one. Uh, if you want more Accessor uh, details and how it works and working with Accessor, you can, I would definitely recommend going to the building classes using Accessor and the ArcGIS uh, API for JavaScript session. Uh, that's gonna be given by Rene and uh, Jan. I, I believe that's later today. Uh, I will confirm later on. Um, so having said that, the Esri widgets um, are all extend Accessor, so we're still part of that same developer experience. So whenever you create a widget, you're able to leverage all the benefits that you get with Accessor. Um, and all of our widgets are being developed with TypeScript. And that's kind of the way we're gonna be showing how to um, extend some of these widgets. So the widget itself has a life cycle and um, right now it, um, it consists of these methods specifically and I'll just talk briefly about them. So constructor, um, as you may know, will get called immediately when you create your widget instance and then the, um, it'll go into the post initialize method where it is, um, the instance is ready but it still hasn't been rendered. So this is where it, a good point for you to kind of set up your your uh, initialization logic. And then there's render that takes care of rendering the state of your widget itself. And this is uh, one of the key, um, I think it's, it's, I don't think, it is the only method that's required for your widget to actually just, um, be rendered. And then there's destroy, a good point for you to kind of do cleanup and tear down logic. Uh, I'm going back to render just to um, kind of get more details about it. So render is the main method that describes how your widget, how your widget will look like. And you don't need to worry about um, keeping references to certain nodes if, you're, if you want to check if a uh, certain property changed. Maybe you don't want to um, unnecessarily update a, no a node or not, one of its properties. You shouldn't think about that anymore. It's just a matter of represent, making sure that the render method represents the current state of your, of your um, widget UI and then the widget framework will take care of rendering for you. Um, it is, like I mentioned, uh, driven mostly by the widget state, so whenever render gets called, you have access to all your properties in your instance and that's where you should make uh, uh, decisions whether you want to, for example, add or remove classes, uh, add nodes, that kind of stuff. The other neat thing is we're using JSX to render our UI, and one of the main ideas behind this was to kind of make it more expressive and get a clearer sense of how your UI is going to, to behave and respond based on the current state. 
Now I'm going to move on to some uh, useful utilities um, for uh, widget development. So Node is, a, um, I would say, a key one. It allows us to run JavaScript on the desktop. Uh, it is synchronous, so we don't have to worry about modules loading before other ones and dependencies. So we use it mostly because we have access to um, uh, NPM modules. And whenever you install Node, you get the package manager installed with it. And it's uh, NPM, and there's a huge library of modules you can just uh, download and, and start using. One of those modules is uh, TypeScript, which uh, we use to um, develop our widgets. The TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. It compiles to JavaScript, which means uh, there's, a, there's a compilation step in our widget development. So we write in TypeScript, and then it gets um, uh, compiled, and we get uh, JavaScript in the end. It is statically type check, which means that it will prevent you from stepping on your toes if you, for example, um, want to assign a, a, a variable of a wrong type that may, later on may cause a bug. It can help you catch those kinds of errors uh, up front. Another really neat feature is that it allows you to use the JavaScript of, you, of the future today and uh, be able to target browsers that don't support, uh, for example, ES6 ES, uh, syntax. So you can write with uh, ES6 uh, syntax, which makes, um, allows you to have your code be more concise and expressive. And it'll compile JavaScript to what uh, ES5 environments understand. So here's an example of what uh, type safety means. Uh, if I have a variable and I define it to be of, of type either map view or scene view, if later on for some reason I decided to assign it a string, uh, I'm going to get a, compiled, uh, a compilation error saying that uh, this type is not correct. You should fix your code. You're doing it wrong. So essentially, TypeScript prevents you, blocks you from doing all sorts of uh, potentially wrong changes. So in order for TypeScript to understand what things are, that's where typings come in. And we uh, define typings. Um, here's a, a simple example. So we can define a set of presenter names to be Alan, Matt, or JC. And then I can define uh, an inter interface per, uh, of type person, which means that any object that conforms to this, to this uh, interface will be accepted. And it, it takes a name and an age. Uh, which is a string and a number, and then I can extend that to create a presenter interface and change the type of name to be a presenter names. So later on, if I want to use presenter of, and use a different name that's not in the presenter names, I'm going to get an error. So that's kind of an example of what, what, um, how typings are defined and how, they're, uh, how it makes, it helps TypeScript know what you're dealing with in terms of code. Another neat thing that I won't go into much detail in this session, um, but we'll, we will cover more in the building um, widgets, is uh, decorators. Decorators are an, ex an experimental um, feature that allows us to extend or enhance a class, a, class, a property, a method, or, or an argument. So as I mentioned, as I showed before, the, we could define, use Accessor to define properties and behave how they, how they, um, how they um, Define the behavior of properties, so we can we can do the same thing with with uh, decorators. And um, here's an example of how we're using um, decorators to make it easier to define properties. So it's just a matter of calling the property uh, the sorry the decorator on top of the uh, in this case property and giving it the parameters that are required for the property to get wired up. This is the same snippet I showed before, but it's using in, uh, it's in TypeScript. So moving on to widgets, uh, at 4 row, all of our widgets are split into views and view models. And um, we did so to, uh, for example, the view models, that's where you will find the core essence of the widget. This is where the main behavior uh, will be found. Uh, it provides everything that the view will be needing for it to render its state and um, provide supporting APIs. So the idea is if you want to create your own view, you just leverage the view model and call its APIs instead of you having to write, rewrite everything from scratch. Uh, it also um, promotes reusability. So you can, if, for example, you want to use a search view model, but you don't necessarily want to display the search widget, you can just import the view model and use its APIs. 
and it should work the same thing, uh, the same way. Uh, typically, in a, in a view model, you will not find DOM or UI concerns, so everything that's business logic is, is will be found in a view model. So, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the main reasons we want view models is, is because of reusability, but it also makes it easy to bring the behavior, the core behavior of a widget in a different framework and just have to only worry about re-implementing the way it looks. And the, uh, another nice benefit is that it separates concerns so it tends to um, produce cleaner code because in your view model you don't have anything uh, related to the UI so it's just business logic. And um, the view, um, on the other hand, is just handling all that UI for you. So, um, I'll be showing an example of how to extend a view model. So um, this little snippet will show how to extend a class in a TypeScript using um, our, our, um, our typings. And when you extend a class, uh, you can either add custom logic to it or, or override existing uh, methods. So depending on your use case, you may want to override or, or add custom logic. So the demo I'll be showing is, um, is a voice search. So I found this neat uh, library called Anyang that allows you to use uh, Chrome speech recognition APIs. And then I wanted to um, make the search widget uh, leverage, uh, be controlled by voice essentially. So I'll be bringing the search view model and then extending it so it, it can behave, uh, be controlled via voice input. I'll be using a mixing approach, which uh, just means that I'll keep all my voice input logic isolated in one single, single module to promote reusability. So if I want to bring voice input to another widget or a view model, I can just go ahead and mix it in, extend the class with this, uh, this mix in, and I don't have to worry about anything else. So first of all, I'll show this demo in action. Where be Palm Springs? Where be Palm Springs? Be patient with me. Where be Palm Springs? Ah, oh, it's not working. Okay. Let's try it again. Where be Palm Springs? All right, I'll move along. The uh, assuming it were um, it would have recognized my voice. I should have then done this. Uh, sorry about that. So, the um, I'll show how I got the how I extended the search view model to do this. So first of all, I'll show the, the mix in itself. Um, so essentially, I'm just creating a class of type um, called voice the input. Hmm? Make the font oh, bit. sorry. There we go. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So um, I'm creating a, a voice input class that extends accessor because I want to leverage the same uh, way of uh, defining properties as we do in the API. And then I'm, for this, to keep it simple, I'm just uh, defining a commands property and a getter and a setter. And whenever the, the setter gets called with a uh, set of voice commands, I'm gonna call this library and register them. And if it's not activated yet, I'm gonna start it. So that's pretty much the, um, the, the, the essence of the mix-in itself. And I'm just extending the um, accessor. And I'll show how I mix it into um, search view model. So pretty similar to the other one, I'm creating a class and I'm extending, in, in this case, search view model and I'm mixing in the voice input mix in, which will include the commands property into the search view model and I will provide a set of default commands, which uh, whenever it gets rec recognized, it'll um, invoke this method. Um, so this is uh, using syntax from that Anyang library I mentioned. 
So I'm just extending my voice, uh, my voice search view model. Sorry, I'm extending the search view model to create this custom view model. And the way I'm using it is pretty similar to if you have ever seen the search um, API doc, you'll see a snippet on how to create a search widget. And it's pretty similar, but in this case, I'm just specifying the voice, uh, sorry, the view model itself. And that's pretty much it. So it's the same, same widget itself, but I'm giving it my custom view model, and it, in terms of UI, it should behave the same, the same way. It's just the, the way the, that you control the search is now um, supposed to, anyways, uh, work with voice commands. And that's pretty, pretty much it. With that, I hand it back to Matt for views. Thanks, JC. All right, so JC mentioned view models and how they're basically the logic, brain, kind of data API, stuff like that. Views are like the opposite of that. They're basically the face or the presentation of the widget, uh, the user interface. So what they do is they interact with the view model and render the data, uh, call the APIs, and stuff like that. So basically the view, specific logic, the, the DOM, stuff like that, that's gonna be in the view. So we kind of mentioned this before, but it's kind of, it separates concerns, that's why we do it. Uh, it allows for reusability. We can um, make different versions of the views that are slightly different um, and you know work in different frameworks, stuff like that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, customize a couple views. We're gonna do um, one view using the compass widget and we're gonna recreate it in using uh, our widget base in 4X. And then we're gonna take um, a view model of the search widget and create a different view for it just using a plain vanilla JavaScript. So here's an example, um, the compass widget. It's basically on 4X, and you can see it's right here. So if I rotate the map, you know, I can see the compass points north that way. If I click it, I'll be reset to that. So we have this simple demo where we have this compass in there, and we want to theme it and make it look totally different so that it looks more like a pirate or vintage compass. So if we look at the um, API pages for the compass, we can see that we have a widget view here. And what we could do is we can actually grab that from GitHub uh, and download the code and then basically tweak it to do whatever we want it to do and rename it to something different so it's like a completely different widget. We also get references to the view model so we can see what the view model does on the compass widget and what kind of APIs it has so for example, it has properties of orientation. We can watch that and get the state of the widget and things like that. So what I've done is I've, um, on our uh, GitHub repo that we have, we'll share at the end, I have a bunch of steps for if you guys want to recreate this yourself, we can do that. But we're just gonna walk through it and show you how, how, it is to, how easy it is to basically create a view for a widget. So I'm gonna go into our code, Oops, I don't want that. Um, in our code we have this demos folder where we have a compass start and a compass complete. So the complete is the, full, the version that's been created. The start is just a basic framework where I have uh, an HTML page and it's just basically creating a view uh, without the compass widget in there. It's uh, requiring the compass widget in, creating it, and it's adding it to the view at the bottom left. So it's the exact same thing we just showed right here. This is the code for that. So if I go back to here, and I go into my demo steps, I actually gonna go over here, close that. So here's my steps. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna set up TypeScript. Um, and since in the essence of time, I've already got that done, but I've linked out to a guide here if you guys wanna do this yourself. 
It's also in our API pages under the Getting Started tab. In our app, what I want to do is, since I'm creating a new widget that's not going to be in the Esri package uh, in our API, I want to set up the Dojo config to create a custom package. So I'm calling this package um, just app, and when I request or require that um, widget, it's going to look in this path that I've defined for that widget. So I'm going to go into my um, HTML page I got here in the start. I'm just going to go right before I'm requiring the API. I'm gonna put that code in so that my package is there. Um, I've already added the TSX file that I showed a little bit earlier on the uh, SDK page. And I've also changed uh, relative paths in that to point to Esri instead of just a, you know, a link that it would be on the API page. Uh, next thing I wanna do is I want to actually set up so that it's watching for changes in this folder and compiling it. So I can do that. And now it'll um, be watching for file changes and compiling. So if I go into my app and I go into the TSX file and I change something, it will basically recompile uh, using TypeScript. Uh, next thing I wanna do is set up my index page to require this new app that we're gonna create called Vintage a new widget we're going to create called Vintage Compass. So I'm going to go back into my code here where I'm requiring the um, compass widget here. I want to just change that instead of requiring the default compass widget to require my compass widget. So now it's going to grab Vintage Compass. And then of course I got to reference that here too so that it's not called Compass, Vintage Compass. And then where I'm creating uh, instantiating the compass, I want to change that to use the vintage compass class now. So right down here, it's now vintage compass, and I'm still adding it to the bottom left. Now I've saved that. I've got this thing saved. Okay, good. Um, now I want to make sure everything's working. So I do like a slight change in the vintage compass file just by putting like a space or something. It should uh, recompile, which it looks like it's doing. And then I can reload the compass and everything should work. But it's still the default compass there. And what we wanna do is tweak it so that we get a totally different UI. So I'll go back to uh, my steps. I'm going to add a style sheet to my HTML page. Anywhere in the head or body will work. I'm just gonna put it up here below this one. And I don't have any CSS in here yet, but we'll put some in there in a second. So I have a link to where I can grab the styles. Uh, it's nothing too complex, just basically um, an animation and then you know a few nodes to style here. So I'm, I already got like a blank file here. I'm gonna put that in. Cool, so now I have like a style ready for my new cool compass. And then I'm gonna start modifying the TypeScript file. What I wanna do first is go into it, and instead of calling it um, a class of widgets compass, I'm gonna call it vintage compass. And I gotta change the bottom so it exports as that too. So export as vintage compass. What I wanna do is remove this um, CSS object in the TypeScript and add this new one because I'm not gonna be using the classes that are set up for the old compass, I wanna use new ones that I define. So in this file, we have this CSS object where we set up all the, the classes that we use. I'm just gonna replace that. So now I'm using a class called Vintage Compass and I'm using the BEMCES um, framework to, or I guess kind of methodology to use that. And then where I, in the render function we mentioned earlier, I wanna change that instead of having you know, the current view, I wanna create my own. So I'm gonna copy this, go into my render method. So I no longer want these classes to be used and this DOM nodes to be used for my widget. So I'm gonna replace those. And then I should be able to let this compile, which hopefully it did and it worked. 
And then if I reload this, I have now this cool pirate theme compass and it kind of like sways and does that kind of stuff. So this is like kind of the first step in our pirate theme app and does the same thing. But as you can see, it's a totally different view. So I can make it, you know, fit my brand or do some custom theme or something like that. So the next one I want to do is show you an example where we're not using our widget framework at all. We're just going to use view models and kind of create our own thing there. So we'll go to the search start. Okay, so there's nothing displayed here because all I'm doing is requiring a view model. Let me show you how that looks. Close this stuff. Search start, index. So it's kind of the same thing. I'm going to make a vintage search. Only thing I've done here is um, basically nothing, just created a view. And again, I have a list of uh, steps we're going to go through. Let me show you the um, basic search, what it looks like first. So this is the search widget. You know, I can type an address. It'll take it to that location. It also does suggestions. So if I do palm, I'll get this nice drop down menu. So that's the search widget. Our API page for the search widget. Same thing, you can grab the TSX file, it links out to the view model, and that's what we're kind of going to be working with here. So let's go to the steps, see what we have to do here. So like I mentioned, this is no TypeScript this time, we're just going to be working vanilla JavaScript here. So the first thing I want to do in my HTML page, I don't have to set up a dojo config or anything like that because I'm just using the view model. I just want to require that view model so that I can use it. So up here, let's require the view model, put it after the scene view. Next thing I gotta do is uh, actually create the view model or instantiate it. So now I have a, a reference to that view model. Now I want to create a node to place the um, UI that I'm going to build in and add it to the view. So I'm just creating a, a div node, and I'm calling it search node variable, and I'm adding it to the view UI in the top right. But right now it's just an empty div, so there's not going to be anything to look at. Um, the next thing I want to do is create my widgets node structure. And so I'm just using vanilla JavaScript. I'm just going to create another div element. I'm going to assign it a class, and I'm going to add it to the container node we just put right here, the search node. So appending this container node to the search node. I'm also going to create a form element with a class, an input node with a class and a placeholder, and a type of search, and then a list node for the suggestions that are going to come back. So it's just really simple, plain JavaScript. I'm just going to paste that in. Um, got the timer, okay, good. Formatting is a little bit off, but it uh, should be okay. okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, next thing I want to do is uh, set a pop-up template on my search view model. Okay, there we go. And I want to create a function for when the form is submitted. And when that happens, I want to prevent the default action of actually submitting the form, um, call a function called clear suggestions, and then do a search on the view model. So I'm going to copy that, put that in. I have a couple more functions I want to create. One is for when um, the search input box detects a key up. And I want to um, call the suggest method after a timeout so that we'll actually get the suggestions. So got search key function, on submit function. I also want a function to remove existing suggestions. And that one's just going to cancel the suggestions that are currently happening, happening and then set a class and remove some inner HTML. And then a function to create the and show the suggestions. 
And what this one's going to do is when um, the suggestions are returned, I want to get them, uh, clear out the inner HTML of the suggestions list, and then iterate through each of those suggestions and create a list item node, assign a class, and set an on click to basically go to that result. So that function goes into. And then create some event, uh, event listeners on the nodes that I created earlier. So on the form node, I want to when on submit is called, I want to call that function on submit. Uh, the input input node, I want to um, on key down, I want to call the search key. And the input node on search, I want to call the search key as well. And then I have some events that I want to listen to on the view model. For when the search starts, I want to clear the su suggestions. Um, on suggest start, I want to clear the suggestions. And on suggest complete, I want to show the suggestions. And lastly, I want to add a style sheet to my HTML page. Because right now it would just be, let's see if it's working right now. So right now it's just this simple input box saying where be treasure, so I can say Palm Springs, and I get some nasty looking drop down, but everything kind of works. So now I just need to add styles to it, and I have those defined right here. So we'll just grab those. Um, not too much CSS, just to kind of style it vintage looking. And I have an empty file in my apps CSS. I'm just gonna paste that in. So now instead of these basic DOM nodes for the search widget, I can get, oh, it's not loading. Did I save it? Did I not put the style sheet in maybe? Maybe that's what happened. Let's try that again. So now I got this cool looking vintage search, pirate themed Palm Springs. Got the cool font. Oh, sorry, it doesn't really fit, but there it goes. So this is another way you can basically create a view for one of your widgets. Instead of using our widget framework, you can just use Vanilla JavaScript or you can use like React or Angular, whatever you want, uh, jQuery, Bootstrap, all those kind of things. So. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Alan, and he's going to sh talk about theming with CSS, uh, using SAS, oh, and kind of the cool stuff like that, showing off some of the out-of-the-box things we have. Cool. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? OK. Cool. All right, so let's talk about theming. Um, kind of one of the things uh, kind of basic to theming is that we're not really changing any of the structure. So we're just kind of laying stuff on top of existing structure, like, like what uh, Matt and JC are doing is kind of deep, pretty cool, and this is more just kind of putting stuff on top of the out-of-the-box node structure. So why you might want a theme, you might want to brand uh, your application um, for yourself or for a client. Uh, you may want to match the theme of the map, the, the colors of that map, or you may want to actually kind of contrast with the map to make your tool stick out further, further. <laughs> Stick out more. Um, and you could also do it based on the environment. Uh, so for instance, if you know that your app is gonna be used, uh, for instance, in the dark a lot, uh, you may wanna use like a dark theme or something like that or theme it for that so that it works better in those uh, situations. And then another kind of, one of the other reasons is uh, really thinking about that user. Um, are they using touch, like e-touch gloves in a cold environment? Uh, are they maybe uh, vision impaired, and so maybe you're going to want to make bigger buttons and things like that. So there's all kinds of reasons to theme. Um, we use SAS uh, to generate our styles, um, and SAS is this, so if you don't already know, it's a powerful scripting language that you can use to produce your CSS, comes with a lot of good tools, uh, and really makes it uh, easy to write styles. Uh, we use SAS because it's modular, uh, so it means I'm not having to repeat a bunch of code, writing less code. Uh, it also makes it really to organi uh, easy to organize that code. 
And then um, one of the kind of added benefits is making it really easy to theme. Um, yeah. Uh, we kind of already talked a little bit about Node, um, and that's how we compile a lot of our stuff. We're using Node to compile our SAS. Uh, you can use Grunt if you want, you can use Ruby, um, any compiling uh, environment you want to use. Cool. So let's uh, kind of get started. Um, really basically, you would go into Esri themes, and then in there you would make a directory called whatever you want to call your theme, uh, and then you would put like a main.scss file in there. Uh, and then once you have that in there, the, uh, your compiler will pick that up and then uh, spit out the CSS in that same directory. And then in your app, you'll put your link to your style sheet, uh, Esri themes, and then CSS instead of the SAS. Um, so before uh, you start thinking about all the selectors you're gonna have to figure out and, and in order to theme, uh, we're gonna talk about that theming approach. We really thought about uh, the style as uh, three basic things. We're talking about color, we're talking about type, and then we're talking about uh, size, so uh, button sizes and things like that. So those are split up into three variable files where you'll have all your default values, so your color hexes, your sizes and pixels, or uh, M's and whatnot, and then your typographies, so fonts and things like that. Uh, so let's have a quick peek at those. So like, here's the color variables, um, size variables, and type variables. We don't really need to go super into that. The reason why is because we have this kind of default um, uh, attribute at the end of these values. So if you overwrite this value anywhere in your style sheet or in your SAS file, it, it'll overwrite with that value. So if in my, uh, if in your theme file you like change the text color to this really amazing blue, then uh, uh, that'll just overwrite this up here. But there's more. Uh, there's, there's magic, right? There'd be magic. So we've got these four basic uh, color variables. Once you set those color variables in your theme, we have a bunch of functions, like you'll see here, that will, do, that will create things like hover text colors and border colors and things like that. So then you're almost like your, your style sheets are kind of, or the, the structure is reactive to what you do with the values. If you wanna like find out more information, we have the theming guide or the styling guide uh, in our doc and you can kind of read through theirs and read through that and get a lot more details about that. So let's kind of get into it. Let's get into the theming demo. So this is like some widgets out of the box. If you've worked with 4X, you kind of know these guys. It's our pop-up doing its thing in the map. So let's say I want to, let's say I want to kind of make my button this kind of blue and I want a nice dark background. So I'm just changing those two variables because I, you know, I looked at my color variables and then I referenced them here and I said those are the things I want to change. So let me get my grunt going. All right. So we'll see we've like, we're rendering out some CSS and I'm just gonna reload this page and we should see some dark widgets with some blue colors. It's a pretty good start, but you'll notice like, hey, my placeholder text is kind of weird, and this is, the text in here maybe isn't quite right. So then I'm gonna come back in, and I'm gonna fix that. And then we should have a little bit more usable theme here. There we go. So because I'm a designer, it bugs me that my borders are like a little bit of a different color. So I'm gonna like tweak that a little bit. Um, and you'll see here I'm using this RGBA function, so that's built into SAS. Uh, so I wanna use that uh, to use a color that I already defined and then make it you know, just 2% opaque. And I don't know about you, but I notice it and I think it looks better. <laughs> okay, so there's that. Uh, 
and our pop-up still looks good. Uh, so then let's talk a little bit about sizes. So we've got these variables like button width, button height. Uh, so I'm gonna bump those up to 42 pixels, get a little bit bigger. Boop, maybe I got fat fingers. And then maybe I wanna get fancy with my typography. Um, and I want a little bit more condensed font. So I can go in and do that. So I've, my typography is a little bit updated. And so I have, you know, a somewhat branded style there. So that's like, that's really basic. You can see like there's not a lot that had to be done in order to like go from that default theme to this. Um, the only real thing I need to make sure and do is include this core file. Uh, that comes out of the base directory, which has like all the styles and whatnot for widgets and, and pop-ups and stuff like that. So that's basic, but if I want to get a little bit more fancy, uh, I can do the same approach, right? So my kind of custom variables, I want to like to define some browns, my pirate font size, text color, and then down into here, um, I've got a few more styles that are gonna give us our um, pirate uh, theme. So this is our fully fledged pirate theme. We've got a piratey stuff, shipwrecks, because pirates wreck them. Uh, but you'll see, the structurally, it's the same, right? All I'm doing here is changing style sheets. So nothing's changing except that style sheet, and I'm getting a completely different look. Yeah, so that's that. So I think I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Alan. Um, so other than that, we have suggestion uh, sessions for you guys to attend to learn more about this stuff. Um, we mentioned earlier building classes using Accessor, uh, since Accessor is such a fundamental part of the API. Um, TypeScript, since it's pretty core with uh, building widgets. And then uh, building your own widget. Let's see, the dark just JavaScript. Um, yeah, tomorrow. And other resources, we have uh, JavaScript sessions. We have the styling API page that we showed a, a second ago. Um, access again, TypeScript, widget development pages and all our 4.3 documentation. So this, this page on the guide, widget development, uh, really useful, kind of goes through all the things we went through here. Uh, if you guys want the source code, this is where you can get it. It's on GitHub. Uh, this is a little short URL. If you want to take a screenshot of that, as we url.com slash widgets2017. Uh, you can kind of go through the, the demos we went through right now, get the, the theme that we created, um, the voice demos on there, all that stuff. So if you have any issues or whatever, you can post on there. Uh, don't forget to take our survey on the uh, events app. Give us feedback. Helps us get better for next time and learn what we can do better. And so we've got 10 minutes left. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer those. Yeah, source code. Question, yes. Because uh, the question was, is it easy to migrate from three to four or do you have to rewrite everything? Um, it's not easy since um, for four we're kind of requiring TypeScript and it's completely different widget base. Um, so it will need to be ported and there's nothing like automatic or anything like that to do that. You guys want to comment on that at all? Uh, it's, uh, to answer your, your question, it's a, re it's a rewrite. Um, you would need to rewrite yeah. the widget. Um, but there, there are ways that we could make it easier. Um, we'll cover some of those strategies in the, was it a deep dive? Yeah, we cover some of that in deep dive and then uh, creating widgets tomorrow. We have a session too, so. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.